I'm going to try to give you what I think is happening with governance. To tell you where I'm coming from, I have just finished a history book on international financial architecture that goes from 1850 to 2008. It took me 10 years to, to do the research and write. I have been working on debt issues for 35 years. And uh, I have watched how institutions have changed, but how the actors have changed, and how the weight of the actors have changed. And then I have also watched how this, that was sort of centered in the financial uh, sector, is now broadening and it's happening in the rest of the multilateral system. So the, the, the beginning of the thing is, my impression is that we have a crisis of multilateralism. And the crisis of multilateralism is related to the change in the international power structure. We have to understand that what used to be the G7 on top, and it is institutionally still called the G7, are no longer the seven largest economies. And that's a big part of the problem. The second thing, of course, is that you have the new emerging, the big emerging actors who are in the top seven, which are Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, and this, of course, leaves a leadership crisis. It's easier to have seven countries of about the same size, of about the same GDP per capita, agree amongst themselves on leadership, and then with a certain structure, a power structure that is a result of the Second World War, uh, then decide and negotiate with the rest of the world. That's one scenario. But when on the top you have such uh, different countries, uh, as the US, Japan, Germany, and then China, India, Russia, and Brazil, then how do we negotiate north-south, or how do we negotiate uh, technical cooperation? The other problem is, of course, because of the change in the power structure, you have a change in the representation in the institutions, look, look at the 43% of the IMF vote, and this referred to the IMF, which I thought that was a good proxy for what's going on in the multilateral system on the whole. 43% uh, of the votes are represented by those seven countries. The next seven hold something like 17% of the votes. So there's a massive disproportion in the multilateral system in sense of voting power. If you put the largest seven now with a new, you see the amount of reserves, it's six trillion dollars. No? The next seven don't add to very much. I mean, if you look at what's happening with the rich countries, and I'm going to say the bad word, if you use the World Bank criteria of indebtedness, of highly indebted, lowly indebted, middle indebted, rich countries are highly indebted. So how, <laughs> you have a, a multilateral system where the highly indebted rich countries that have no growth, that don't have international reserves, have the, def the currencies, the reserve currencies, and define global interest rate policies. Really? And the rest of the large countries sort of have to accept this passively. Why? And that's, that's, I think that's the issue. And that's why multilateralism is in crisis, from my point of view. Here you have general numbers, the indebtedness of the formal G7, they have 212% the debt of the BRICS countries plus three. They are 20% larger in terms of GDP, and they have 43% less international reserves than the BRICS plus three. 
but they have 309% the number of votes of the other ones. That is a nonsense. That's an absolute nonsense. So what happens when the institutions do not reflect the change in the power structure and economic reality? <coughs> they become hopeless. And the thing is, how is then policy made possible in, a glo in an increasingly global world when you have a situation of a multilateral crisis? And the answer to that is you bilateralize the mechanisms. And they become increasingly bilateral. So you have a multilateral system, which is there. But if you look at the League of Nations, <coughs> at the end, the League of Nations was the dialogue between two, the United Kingdom and whomever, to the demise, I mean, to the peril of the League of Nations. And I have the impression that's what's going on. What we're having is this bilateralization of the relationship. But on top of it, it is one thing when we speak of multilateral public and bilateral public, but then on top, private interests are defining the global agenda. So the bilateral relationship is becoming privatized on both ends. You have a privatization of the bilateral relationship. You have a privatization of the state in the emerging economies, an increasing privatization of the state. You have the same problem of the presence of the financial sector that you have in the United States. We have it in Brazil, in Chile, in Peru, or you keep on going. In Ghana, I can name a thousand countries, Germany. Uh, it, it, that's the way it's working. It's, we're having the states become privatized in their logic of functioning and become more interested in defending certain private interests than the common good. So this, this um, converts the international system from a multilateral system to a bilateral system, from a bilateral public system to a bilateral private system. The system is changing, but the new actors are not acting, and the old actors are not giving up their power, because why should they? And if nobody is questioning, then nobody is going to give up anything. So what you have is this tension of, it's a dysfunctional tension. And in the middle of this, we have the Millennium Development Goals, we have the Sustainable uh, Goals, we have all kinds of multilateral agreements that, okay, as, as long as uh, the bilateral actors are there, this is going to function to some extent. If for the bilateral actors it's not useful, it will not function. The multilateral system will not have the capacity to enforce it. And I think that's where we are. <laughs>